when I first saw him. I knew then, this was the master for me. I want to be a driver for your son. Hey, how much rope? Hey, don't do that. <laughs> hey, driver! I'm Pinky, nice to meet you. Balram, have you ever seen a computer? See, we had many of them in the village with the goats. Okay, the so goats are pretty advanced to use computer. Okay, now you're being a jerk. I didn't like the way he had spoken about me. Since I was a boy, the desire to be a servant yeah. had been hammered into my skull. I, Balram Halwai, I drove the car. I was alone in the car. They made me sign that confession. Why would you kick him? Why would you hit him like that? You're my driver! I want to break free. I want to break free. They had plans. I had plans too. I want to break free. I would have to become the creature that gets born only once every generation. The white tiger. That's what I call myself these days. I'm just one who has woken up while the rest of you are still sleeping. I haven't seen you in about two years or maybe, uh, maybe more. And I saw your movie twice now, White Tiger. And my congratulations, the most sincere congratulations go out to you. You deepened and deepened. Your 99 rooms blew me away. I thought that was a masterpiece of a single focus, you know, two characters, beautifully done in Florida. But my God, this movie uh, is a classic. I think it can't, it can't, it won't go away. It's just got so many subplots, plots, people, incidents, and a main theme that drives it. it to me, this is a masterpiece again, and on a big scale. So whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Take the vitamins or whatever food you're eating. <laughs> push up, push up. Well, as I told you um, when we met that God knows how much I stole from you on 99 Homes. Um, I, I think I just told you I took so many things out of Wall Street for 99 Homes, but you, you know this and I've written it in many places that you're one of the directors I admire the most and that impacted my thinking about movie making and what could be done. You can't oh, bribe me. I, I would tell you the same thing about White Tiger if you had well, invested my films. Man, that JFK, I'll never forget when I saw it. It was the first of your films I saw on a big screen in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, at the Haynes Mall Cinema, in this shopping mall. And, the, and, the, and I that came out into the parking lot. And I remember because it was dusk when I came out. And I remember thinking to myself, I cannot trust in anything, not even the pavement I'm walking on. That's for sure. That's yeah, sure. the movie, the editing in that movie is so good. The editing is, I always think that you and Scorsese are the best director editors of, of um, you know, modern America. Let's, let's talk about yours because we don't have that much time and the audience wants to hear about White Tiger, which yeah. has to be seen. It's got, I hope it breaks through in America. I, you know, these things are tough because it's a foreign, it's a, you're an Iranian filmmaker making a film about India from an Indian novel very great novel, a new one, a new writer, whose name is uh, Aravind Adiga. And th there's the similarities between Iran and Ar in India. Are, I know so I've been in both countries, but why, what attracted you to an Indian story like this and to go so deep into this underworld that you do? Honestly, it was Arvind Adiga, the author. We've been friends since college, actually. He's one of my closest friends. We talk probably twice a week for 25 years now. And, um, so we met in the mid, 
mid 90s at Columbia University as undergraduates and stayed friends since then. And he's been reading all my screenplays. Um, oh, I see. Sort of a, a, I understand. Well, very lucky. This man is very talented. This is his first novel. This was his first novel that won the Man Booker Prize in 2008. Oh, I see. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. no, that's a surprise to me. I didn't know that. But, yeah, it's uh, an incredible book. And I had been reading rough drafts of the novel since 2004. So I had been waiting almost 15 years to make it. You're a great adapter. Did you, is this precisely the same dialogue or are there major changes from the book? Um, I'd say it's at least 60% his dialogue. The voiceover probably 60%, at least his. Yeah. And then, you know, you have to change things as you know very well um, to get them to work on camera. Voiceover, uh, yeah, the voiceover technique you use is brilliant because it works. And that's always the, the, the people can argue about the theory behind it, but if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, you know it. Uh, the, uh, it has a Camus-like, Albert Camus-like effect on the movie because frankly, you love, you love the, the main character, his eyes alone. His name is Ardarsh Goran. He's got the most beautiful eyes, sympathetic. At the same time, he's, he's ruthless. And uh, what he does is monstrous, but at the same time, you understand it. So he's very much reminds me of a Camus character, you know, even better because you, you, you really understand him in depth. Whereas in Camus, uh, The Stranger, you don't quite understand the man as well, but still you're in, in deep, you're in deep waters when you have him go the way he does. Uh, you break all the taboos, as far as I can see, from India because you you play with the idea that Indians are the most charming and they they're very Hindu and they they uh, they they're serving class. But uh, you show the deceit in that serving class and the hypocrisy. You're very blunt about it. And I, it, that brought me to the idea that you're going in the waters of Dostoevsky. It becomes like, a, a, you know, I'm sure you read him and Crime and Punishment comes to mind is that he's got this brewing, brewing uh, anger and yeah. violence in him. Oliver, you're talking about two of my favorite writers. Um, yeah. My first film, Man Push Cart, was inspired by Albert Camus' myth of Sisyphus, his understanding of the absurdity, his theory of absurdity wrapped up into that myth. And Dostoevsky is my favorite writer. Um, and Crime and Punishment is a novel Arvind and I talked about for years and years and years. Um, you know, I didn't know that. I just sensed it from the work. Yeah. It's, it borders on that because he, well, there's, I, uh, he does so much to, he loves his master, serves him, does everything he can for him. And the master, of course, is an half Indian or all Indian, but he comes back from America. So presumably you're saying he's been corrupted by the, by the Americans, which you criticize in the film. You say America's done for, the white race is done for, China and India are coming on, which are strong statements and may make you some enemies. But I think there's a lot of accuracy in what you're saying that China and India's moment on the world stage is now. Uh, I guess when you get to the climax, which is the killing, yeah, your moment, your stranger moment when he turns on his master. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that a bit? I can tell you just practically about the shooting of it because my, my hope was if I shot it intimately, handheld, in there with them, inside of it, that we would feel the immediacy and the emotional content of this murder, of this man, these two men that kind of liked each other, that he, you know, that, that twisted relationship that they had and the challenge that Balram has to do the action. That, that was why I wanted to be up there with them. But there's one shot that I planned, which is a, let's say a medium lens wide shot at 96 frames a second, slow motion. And with this really heavy rain, like some kind of a Kurosawa style rain that I really wanted because it's not, the movie's not just about Balram and Ashok, it's about master servant, rich and poor. And I wanted that shot to make it epic, to make it about a centuries old battle between rich and poor and master and servant. And that, that's kind of why I went to that slow motion wide shot to hopefully make you feel that it was more than just a personal thing. There was something bigger at stake here. And that, that was kind well, of- One of the most powerful shots in the movie for me visually was before, just before that, when he goes to the zoo with the young boy he takes as his protege, he goes to the zoo, he visits the white tiger. Yeah. 
is in Mum in 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 Mumbai, but he's in De he's in Delhi. In Delhi, I'm sorry. Yeah. In Delhi. That's all right. He's in Delhi, yeah. But the way you shoot the white tiger, you make the point so clearly in three or four close-ups on a wide shot that this is a turning point in the film. Uh, yeah, it's what pushes him to do it. Why the novel is called a, what, The White Tiger. Yeah, that pushes him to do it. I, I, we had to travel uh, north of Delhi to get to this safari that had that tiger. And I had no <laughs> idea what it was going to do. But I just stood there and I walked like this back and forth and it followed me for almost 20 minutes. And we got all this in 20 minutes and then the tiger was bored and didn't do anything after that. So we managed to get the whole thing of this tiger in 20 minutes and then turned around to get the actor. Um, it's also the editing of it too. Yeah, yeah. And the music was really good there. The music Danny. was excellent. What, who, who wrote the music? It's these two guys in Los Angeles, Danny and Sonder, who were very good. Um, they were pretty keyed into we just talked about character. What, what is this moment going to be for the character? You know, and how do we get the music for the character? It's very, yeah. long, very, yeah. very, very underscored, but it really hits you hard. And but you talk about Dostoevsky, like if I could connect that murder to the last scene of the film, because the very last scene is again from Arvin's brilliant book, um, where he upends Dostoevsky, which is I think what makes the the novel so radical because he tells his drivers that in the typical Hindi film, which when I hear that, I think the typical anything, including Dostoevsky, when you've committed this murder, you're haunted by it and you have nightmares where yeah. the person murder chases you and says, shame, shame with a bloody finger. And he says, no, 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 that's not the nightmare. The nightmare he's waking up from sweating and, and palpitating heart is that he didn't do it, that he right. didn't that he's still a servant to another man. He's still, that, the, he's still in the rooster coop. He's still in the coop. And that, that that's his nightmare. To me, in Arvin's book was so radical and so fresh and modern, you know? Well, that's what puzzled me a little bit uh, because sometimes you were tricky. I mean, you have flashbacks and inside flashbacks, it's seemed to me. At one point, he actually tells his master, I want to smash your head in and steal yeah. the four million rupees. Yeah. You have yeah. Back. And the master shrugs at it and says, you better take a rest. You need to go home. Seems like he sends him away and fires him and the replacement takes over, which is a big issue too. But then you come back to the scene and he's got, he's still involved with his master and he's, he's about to deliver the 4 million rupees. Was that a fantasy about telling his master? Yeah. Yes. Oh. I mean, in, in the, there's a few beats like that where in the movie it's in his head or he talks to animals in the movies and the animals talk back yes. to him in the book, in the novel. And I wanted to risk that an audience could just feel he must not have said it because why is the master not reacting to that? And it was a real risk for me to just hope an audience would follow that. They would. Yeah, that could, that's a little confusing, but it's a. But on the other hand, it's human enough, realistic enough that you buy it. I mean, yeah. the master is the master is weak. He's a weak man. That's his problem. Yeah. And, and uh, he's not to be trusted because the servant loves him for because he thinks he's human, he has humanity, and he does. There's quite a bit of humanity. He doesn't want to be, don't call me master and all that kind yeah. of stuff. But when, the, 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 when they have the accident and they, they're responsible for killing their child, they dump it on the servant, which yeah. is the way it happens, I suppose, in India. And it's well done because you have two great subsidiary characters. It's great. One is the stork. Yeah. One of the evilest looking people I've seen. <laughs> His face alone tells you, and then the, uh, the what, do you call the, uh, the, what do you call the other the mongoose. the mongoose the mongoose oh my god the mongoose but is, Oliver uh, the stork the stork is a, is a very strong director in India he's a filmmaker oh. in addition to being an actor he's a strong director which was awesome to, to work with him and the stork I'm sorry the mongoose he's a famous screenwriter in India <laughs> yeah well, everybody acts in India it seems like a family show must have been a great shoot for you to be surrounded. It was the, I enjoyed the filming more than I've ever enjoyed filming anything. I somehow, I, I, I'm not a very, I, sometimes I don't have enough fun. I'm not a fun kind of person. I'm more serious minded, but the novel had something fun about it, despite how heavy the subject is. Yeah. Yeah. And so I thought if I don't have fun making it, then the audience is going to have fun watching it. Right. So, it's fun. The fun is all throughout. It's yeah. the way you shoot. There's humor in it. And this comes from a, the, the power of your growth. You've done three, four movies now. 
and it's so clear that you there's a progression in your in your ability uh, and your capacity to understand life but you're not you're you're an Iranian and yeah how come you understand all these little details of Indian life how did you would you grow up there or did you no, spend time no. there I mean it, a few things I mean it's the same as 99 Helms. Like, how did I know all those details about the housing crisis and about frauds and scams? You just kind of do the research and be there. And um, here, part of it was just going to India for a few months prior and, and getting involved in it and going to all the locations in the novel and walking them by foot and talking to people, spending a lot of time talking to drivers. And then I hired a crew that was 99% Indian. I only brought three or four people with me from the West. Everyone else was Indian. That helped. And then, you know, uh, Iran, yeah, go there's ahead. a lot of similarities in Iran. I mean, my dad grew up in a village very similar to Balram. He, he didn't have running water or electricity till he was six or seven. He grew up with all those animals like Balram did. He, instead of hugging a water buffalo, my dad would hug a donkey, you know. And I lived in that village. I've been there for two, three years. I lived in Iran. So that helped. I, I had some feeling about it. This kind of serving thing, we have that in Iran. Maybe not the same, but we have yeah. this. Kind of Balram saying things like, oh, you're paying me too much. Pay me half of that. We have all that yeah. kind of culture in Iran, you know. I love it when he's driving them to the village, his home village, uh, Pinky. And, uh, yes. and he keeps uh, crossing himself. And he says, there's a path that Buddha walked down. I, I love that kind of humor. It's and, the, yeah. and they fall for it, of course. I love that, too. Yeah, I love that. Uh, but that raises another issue, the home village, which is really a big, big issue to me. Because I've always associated India through the films of, uh, uh, you know, Sachi Ray with, with family. Yeah. The structure of the family is crucial to India. It's the way I've always felt. But your film turns it on its head. Yeah. Uh, what you're saying is that the grandmother, this is a blood-sucking parasite, and the brother, all these people clinging to the family structure in this awful little village are bound by their blindness. They don't see. All they want is money from... Uh, the young man who makes his way to Delhi. And uh, he hates it, he hates it. And he's very honest about it. He hates that feeling of being trapped. And I, uh, I, I, not being an Indian, I don't know the threads. I mean, maybe the novelist who wrote this is, is cynical about his family life, but it does, it does uh, it's, to me, it shocks. It shocks, it challenges all the value system of family. And I think I like that about it, you know, and, and right now, of course, it's on Netflix. So it's been the number one movie How's on it? Netflix. It's well, the number one movie on Netflix in India since it opened, including over all their series. Wow. Since, um, that's amazing. January, that's from and, January 22nd. And, and the reactions? Very good. And if I could tell you something else, Oliver, it was the number one movie in the world in 64 countries. It was number one for like a week all over the world. It was totally crazy that even I woke up this morning, I got an email from a friend of mine in Bolivia a week ago or two days ago. I got an email from someone in Mexico. I got an email from someone, a friend of mine whose family, they're all from Zimbabwe. I get emails from all over the world telling me this is like where I come from. And this, this made sense to me and my friends. It felt like a oh, Brazil. I get a lot of notes from Brazil. And um, it's interesting how around the world, even to some degree in a Western country, people feel something that they understand it, you know, in ways well, that I never anticipated. I mean, every family has issues. Uh, every family is, you know, some, a lot of people always feel their relatives are always, you know, want something from them. It's, I mean, that's, it's a common it's condition. Your, emotionally or your solution to it is pretty radical though. I have <laughs> to say, I mean, I think it's shocking and, uh, I, you know, I don't know, but I thank God you're born in the Netflix era. You know, for in my era, 30 million people to see your movie was a pretty big deal. So it would take forever. Now you can do it in a week. My God. In a way, Netflix does bring wide distribution. I think I have some memory that we emailed at some point, like a, month, a year ago, or I told you I was making a movie and we t I emailed you about Netflix and telling you that I was just, I don't think who else would have financed this movie. You know, I'm amazed that they did. They probably did it out of their Indian bureau. Thinking. No, 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 no. It was done at, it was done with Scott Stuber's division in Los Angeles. I needed a real budget to make this thing. So it was done out of Los Angeles. Um, of course, the team in India helped us. Netflix in India helped, but 
it was done. Really, uh, Scott Stuber should be uh, praised as a very, very, uh, very sensitive executive, and she, she's the sees how powerful this could this film could be. He was super helpful in getting it made, and honestly, for a studio head, his notes were really good. Honestly, he, he had good feedback that helped the film. That's so great to hear. With, um, That's and, great to hear. Yeah, I don't know how else the thing would have gotten done. An entirely Indian cast, an Iranian director in India, 30% in Hindi language, and they gave me this much money. I shot for 60 days. I mean, never shot this much in my life, you know. 60 days you got. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. I have to congratulate you again. It, it was well worth 60 days. What you've done in my eyes is a, a masterpiece, and at the same time, it's a big, messy film. It's got subplots. It's got people that come in and out. It's, you can't always put the, it's not coherent as a whole sometimes, but it is in the end, it comes together. So uh, you're able to deal with, like a novelist, you're able to deal with all these different themes, sub themes. One thing that I wanted to, I mean, what, for example, at the beginning of the movie, you, you do Parasite in it's kind of a, in a, uh, in a clipped form, you do a form of Parasite. He goes into a family as a, he lies his way in, tells his master he's the greatest thing on earth and the guy's a pig and he becomes driver number two in a compound and then he screws to driver number one who's a wonderfully nice humble man who's been doing his job for 20 years he gets his job by revealing by following him and finding out that he's a muslim yeah yeah talk about that well this is all from the novel in fact i i, I loved parasite um, and i sometimes wondered if he had read arvin's book um, cause there are some similarities, um, but this was straight out of the novel and I, and I loved it. You know, the, the, um, part of the, the, what you talked about earlier was that I kept thinking to myself, how am I going to keep an audience with Balram? And a, a lot of it had to do with that actor. He was just so likable, you know? Um, and then also just trying to find the tone, you know, I, you're really good at tone because you've done so many different things like. I mean, when I think about, I don't know, uh, Born on the Fourth of July to JFK to Natural Born Killers, they're like such different tones, but you managed to do them cohesively. And here, it was a tone I had never done. Like this in 99 Homes, the, there's some themes that are the same, but the shooting style and the tone was very different. And, and that, again, was coming from the novel. How, how I kept thinking, how do I achieve that tone? Okay, well, tone is... Uh... You see, I, that's, it raises for me a question that always has bothered me in this business. I mean, what you put down on paper, if you read what he does on paper, he screws as the driver no. number one, and he doesn't seem, he, I mean, he's, he does some actions that are pretty ruthless. And, yeah. and unless you have an actor with the face that he has, that innocence in his face and the smile, that shows you the problem we have in screenwriting or novels. Yeah. I mean, you, what you put on paper, you might see him a certain way, but the audience may not receive him that way, but when you see a movie, you have an actor who helps you. And the actor, yeah. that's a difference in a movie. The actor can take that margin that you bear, you're not making the margin, but he can take the margin over to the other side. I, when you do that, well, like when you're working, do you think, do you have the tone in your mind as you're writing it? Or do you start to develop the tone when you're going from the script to the screen? Frankly, uh, I, you have a definite tone, you have a definite point of view. and it changes in the rehearsal process to some degree because the actor does bring uh, another aspect to it. Yeah. I, th I think of Al Pacino, he deepens everything. He can, makes it uh, Anthony Hopkins, these people, uh, uh, whereas other actors, they're, they're, they're leading men, but they have to, you have to give them the formula that works for them. They have right. to be on the good side, for example, Jim Garrison. I mean, they have to be the guy that fights for truth and justice. Right. Uh, but when you have a, well, Woody Harrelson was great because he gave what I wanted to. The, he took a miserable motherfucker. I'm sorry. To, he took a miserable uh, character who was a killer with Julia Lewis, and he made him charming to to a certain yeah. degree, to at least to some people who were not too who, who had who understood the humor in the role. But uh, Woody is a, is act, Woody brings a difference. You see, you, your actor he did, he's uh, beautiful and. He's oh, got you got the, the best it. smile in the world. I mean, the beginning he seems what he is, and then when he starts to lie to manipulate, yeah, uh, it's a magic. And then there's that great moment you sh when he decides he's going to go the other way, 
like this is a servant again by Joseph Losey. Uh, he's uh, James Fox, and if you remember correctly, it was uh, Dirk Bogart, right? Yeah. Well, Dirk Bogart's kind of an actor who can give that kind of sense to it, but more malevolent than your actor. Your actor start drinks the scotch. He goes to the scotch bottle, and that the scotch is everything that represents his way of, un, does not represent his way of life. And he says, you know, for us to have a, a bottle of Johnny Walker would have cost a year's salary. Johnny, the Johnny Walker bottle, Johnny Walker Black is a big thing in the novel. In fact, he kills him with a Johnny Walker Black bottle, actually. And it's I a see. big deal that he's using the rich man's bottle to kill him. He was really good. You know, he, Adarsh came, he was a uh, fully trained actor. He got a scholarship to the best acting school in India. He had done some supporting roles, but never a lead. But he totally dedicated himself to it. He went to a village and lived there anonymously for a couple of weeks. Like he didn't tell them he was an actor. He worked in a tea shop in Delhi for two, three weeks. Did you find him in a casting session? Casting session in India. Just walked yeah. in? You had open sessions? I had said, no, well, the casting director was bringing people she liked. And he, he knew, like, there were big stars in the Indian diaspora in the West and in India that wanted the role. And I want to work with them. They're all amazing. But I, I felt this part should have a newcomer, an unknown person. And um, he came in thinking he would never get the part. He was just excited that the casting director in India, who was one of the top ones, Tess Joseph, he was oh, just excited right. she called him and he wanted to impress her so that she might call him for some other movie that he might have a chance at getting. I want to ask you another question which puzzled me in the film. His sexuality. It was, it's a tough one to deal with because in movies we never, we very rarely show the sexuality of our, of our protagonist, correct? Because it's always better not to because if you show that somebody's going to object to this or that you know it's always some negative aspect to sexuality very tricky subject and in the, i don't know the novel but here he doesn't seem to have any sex life at all uh, external one uh, except looking at pinky and looking at his masters well there in the novel um he has one experience at a brothel when he learns how to drive with that driving instructor that's in the beginning and that you see, I never had that in the script, but there's another sequence that I actually filmed and I cut it out. There's a sequence, there's a whole sub story in the, in the second half of the film after Pinky Madam goes to back to New York where his master gets wrangled into going to see a prostitute with one of these politicians that he's bribing. Oh, that's and great. Yeah. He sleeps with this blonde, blonde prostitute that looks like Kim Basinger. <laughs> the the novel. And then Balram's character saves up the money that he's stealing to try to do the same thing. But when he goes to the prostitute, he finds out she's wearing a wig, she's not blonde, and he doesn't end up sleeping with her. He gets into a fight with her and the motel manager. But there, in the novel and in the film, there's some indication that he's physically attracted, as you, I think, said, both to the man and the woman. Oh, I didn't. I didn't both. Just there's a hint of it. Life of Pi, did that ring any bells for you? Um, I like the film, but no, not really. Um, mainly I was, I was looking at, um, I looked at, at some of Kieslowski's films. I, I looked at Decalogue 1 and 5. 5 is the one about uh, a short film about murder. Um, I looked at that for the, there was something about the lenses. Like you talk about Dostoevsky or Camus, some of those lenses in, in his film short film about killing were so psychological and disturbing. I was really looking at that. And then sometimes I was looking at, um, for the shooting, I was sometimes looking at Goodfellas because it's an epic story from childhood to adulthood. It had voiceover. It takes you into a world that you're not familiar with, these Italian Americans and their gangster world and their details of the food they eat and the things they do and the hierarchies they have. So I was looking at that a little bit too. Um, yeah. Well, um, uh, the uh, I, one little touch I loved was when he becomes a big shot. He gets a, he buys his own cab company, right? He, he, his uh, driver company. He calls it the White Tiger Company, and you yeah. and play that up. But and you say, how does how does he get to this new position in Bangalore, which is a new city in India, the South India that's very technologically Western yeah. oriented? And he says, I got. He shows you. He says, I get rid of the competition. And how did he get rid of the competition? The old fashioned way. He goes into the police office and of course he gives a yeah. huge bribe to the, yeah. uh, the police chief. Yeah. 
who busts all the other drivers for <laughs> expired licenses and such. Yeah, he learned from his master how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a ruthless society. It's a dog eat dog world you've described. Yes, yes sir. I mean, you have, yeah. uh, I hope there's more hope in it than <laughs> what you show because, uh, you know, I think I've certainly benefited from a sense of society's mercy, but I can understand that at the lowest, poorest level, that's not that's not often the case, but I don't know the lowest, poorest level. And I come back to my original question to you, which was, is there more love in these families or spiritual help for each other than is shown in this novel? You know, even if there is, I think the heart of the novel was this is his perspective, Balram's perspective. and. Mm -hmm even if it makes us question things a little bit. I think part of his perspective is a bit, there is an exaggeration to it, mm -hmm. but I think in that exaggeration, we can see something true, you know? Um, I don't know, when I look around me now, even in America, it doesn't seem that far off the, the kind of world. Um, even when I think about my cell phone, which I can call any number of servants to do anything for me, bring my food, drive me somewhere, you know, uh, put together a, a table and leave. Um, it wasn't and, always that way for you. No, but I mean, it wasn't all that, it wasn't always that way for any of us, right? The, the, what's interesting in the novel, and I think what made it very divisive when it came out in India was the novel is also attacking the middle class because ba Balram is not somebody that only works for the rich in India. It, it's a middle class. Middle class people have servants. And I think now for us in America, if there is a middle class, if you have some small income, let's say you're not just treading water, which is how most people live, right? You're one check away from losing. Then these servants on your phone that, that deliver your food and, and drive you with Uber and you know do things, they, they are in a way ballrooms. You know, they are, there is some, we're inching in that direction, I think, um, in ways that I'm very anxious where we're heading. Um, well, you say the American. Maybe you could say the American way of life has become middle class. In other words, that was always the idea. America would expand, would bring more and more comfort to the middle class, which would be the, the majority of society, and we created a middle class world. And that's always been a, an observation made by sociologists, uh, which leads to a sort of closed loop. It leads to a kind of general. Uh, malaise, a, a decadence that sets in and inevitably society, the entropy part of it happens and it starts to go the other way, which seems to be kind of maybe happening now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what America has done so brilliantly, well, it's not, we're talking about America now, but it's just, I can't believe that we haven't had inflation with all the, all the uh, ex huge amount of money that's been ingested into our system. We're we'll see what happens. Buying, so buying far, gold, guess, right? We should buy gold because we're printing money as if it's fake money. I mean, it's really, I don't understand it either. I'm waiting for that to happen. Well, we might find that we are in a rowboat with a tiger <laughs> rowing <laughs> in the Arabian Sea. Yeah. Thank you so much, I mean, This was Thank you. a fascinating movie. Uh, well worth seeing a second and third time.